Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session about correlating metrics across the continuous delivery pipeline. My name is Harold Zeitelhofer. I'm from Dynatrace. Uh, we are a company in the performance management area. We are uh, headquartered here in the US, but I'm from our lab in Austria, in Europe. You might hear, in, hear it in my accent that I'm not from here. Um, and yeah, let's start. Well, correlating metrics across the continuous delivery pipeline, what has that to do with Nginx? Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's the big bullet point, or one of the big bullet points here for the conference, speakers talking about their success stories with Nginx. Uh, well, yeah, we are, we are Dynatrace. We are a company in the performance management, performance monitoring sector. So is monitoring Nginx our success story here? Well, not really, not actually. Uh, it's a little more complicated. Um, Let's turn back the wheel of time a couple of years, around 20 years ago, when we had web servers that populated the internet that time. It was mainly servers surfing static content, HTML files. On the other hand, a couple of years later, these, these other servers emerged serving dynamic content. Mainly we had environments based on the LAMP stack, so Apache servers running on a, on a Linux machine with PHP talking to MySQL. And actually that was really where, where the, the internet, where, where the World Wide Web was, was starting, where it became really popular. But even back in, that, in those times, um, performance already mattered. And it was especially that part of the application where performance was an issue. And when we talked about performance back in these days, uh, we, it was mainly the, the dial-up line, how the, the user was connected to the internet. So other sections in the application, like the web server, didn't matter if the web server was slow or not, because the dial-up connection was slower anyway. No one cared if the database was too slow because the dial-up connection was slow anyway. On the other hand, uh, during the years, these environments have changed. We have now much more complex environments using different tiers talking to each other, using different technologies, different web servers, different languages in the back end, different databases but also on the front end, different browsers offering different functionality. We all know that Internet Explorer behaves differently than, for instance, Firefox. On the other hand, external web services that we are connecting to. But still, performance matters, but not just at one part of the application, but through the entire stack here. Really starting in the browser, what's happening there, all the way through the web server, the application, down to the database, and all the way back. And actually, we, we, we had these architectures for quite a while now, but now the environments are changing again, and these large monolithic applications are split and the applications are deployed in services, in, in microservices. Small parts talking to each other, every single service for its own purpose. But still, performance matters. Performance is very important to really create an environment, an application that, that can be used by our users. And when I talk about performance, it's for sure on the one hand about speed. We all want to have fast websites, fast web applications, fast response times. These are one of our main KPIs for websites. And even it influences our search results in Google. So Google also considers 
page response times in, in ranking your website in, in the search results. But it's not just about speed. It's also about usability. Our websites have to be cool. They need to be easy to be used. If we have a, a web application that's just impossible to, to be used, if a, a web application that just sucks, no one cares whether it's fast or not. People won't use it anyway. So usability is a big topic. But not just on laptops or desktop devices, especially mobile devices are becoming more and more important for our entire environment. Especially in the last almost 10 years since we got the first iPhone, this is really where the, the mobile revolution started. And we have to make sure that our applications on the one hand provide the same experience in the same user experience in, in, on a mobile device, but maybe the functionality itself that the application provides on the mobile device is different from the functionality on the desktop. For instance, uh, we have numbers that, that show that in the, in the electronic banking area, mobile devices are very important, but not, are not really used for making payments. People use mobile devices for, making, for checking their bank account, but for doing transactions, for doing payments, they still use desktop devices or laptops to, to perform that. On the other hand, it's important to have reliable applications. We don't want that. When we go to a website to go to a certain application, we want to see a working page, especially when it's an application that we all use in our daily life. Facebook, as seen earlier today, this, I took the screenshot this morning. So something went wrong, Facebook was not available. All these responses where we get a page, sorry, something went wrong, not available. Again, it's, we don't care whether that's fast or not. So not only speed matters, it also has to work. Otherwise, we would, uh, it would result in frustrated users at, at, the, at, at the other side of the browser. So coming back to our application, it's, we, we mentioned that it's very important to have performing parts throughout all of the entire stack here in the application. And this is especially where Nginx uh, plays a major part. Uh, during all the years, even before I joined Dynatrace, I worked in, for many projects in, in web application development and enterprise uh, applications, mainly in, for, for database applications. And speed, performance, usability, all these facts that I talked about were always uh, very important there. And especially now in, in in my role as a performance advocate at Dynatrace, where we work closely together with people in the community, developers, customers, helping them to drive their performance management. On the one hand, we see that one of the major hotspots is still in the application itself, not in, in, a, in an engine like a Java engine or PHP engine. These are pretty fast. A lot of uh, improvements have, to, have been done there over the years, but really the code. So, uh, we see a lot of, not, not performance issues, I would really like to say performance bugs. So it's really buggy code, not, not functional bugs, but performance bugs that have to be fixed. On the other hand, it's Nginx that plays a major role here in being the key factor of providing fast applications, fast environments. Not just by replacing existing technology, uh, when using Nginx as a replacement for Apache, for instance, but also by using Nginx for additional functionality to use it as a, as a caching layer or 
to provide uh, scalable infrastructures uh, with using Nginx Plus as a, as a load balancer, for instance. And this is actually our success story, more or less together with, with Nginx. On the other hand, we talked about metrics, performance management, performance monitoring. So when we have the application, it's important that we consider performance in every single part here. Every single tier, the database, the application, the backend, the web server, the browser, and to do proper monitoring there. During all the years when we, when we grew our applications, when we grew our environment, we also established monitoring systems, monitoring environments here. But most times we used, we used silos. So for instance, we had database monitoring tools monitoring the database performance. So we made the DBAs happy because whenever a problem came in that a transaction was slow, the user called and said, hey, it's, it's so slow, I can't, I can't use the application. We called the database administrator and told him about our problem and he said, well, yeah, the application is slow, my database is fast, your problem. So we all know that. It's not to make a DBA happy or a system operator happy, it's about making the user happy. So the one or these guys that we create our applications for, these should be happy using our applications. And that's why we have to start monitoring there, not just what they are doing, but mainly how they are doing. And tracing the transaction from the user all the way through the entire stack down to the database and back to be able to find out where our real hotspots are. Okay, well, this is more or less where should we start monitoring at the user. The other question is when should we start monitoring? So monitoring in a production environment is important, is necessary. So we need to find out when there are issues, when there are problems, we need uh, to be able to trace it down. But wouldn't it be a good idea to start earlier already, also with our performance monitoring, maybe in, in, in the testing phase, or even before that, during development? Is there something we could do already here to find out performance hotspots in our production environment. I'll give you an example. One of the top hotspots in, in for uh, responsible uh, factors for bad performance is uh, overloaded pages. And this is not a fake screenshot. This is actually a screenshot of a website that was really once online in the, in the web. And in 2008, this website even made it to the worst website of the year. And uh, there is still a version of that available in an, in, a, in an archive. And when you watch that page render, uh, being rendered, it's, it's uh, funnier than watching a, a, a comedy show. So uh, overloaded pages, a lot of static content uh, on, on web pages because when pages are built, we put an image here and we add something here and then an add here and whatever. And, and finally, it results in websites with huge amount of static content resulting in pages with 20, 30, 50 megabytes, sometimes more. And these issues don't only occur on websites created by newcomers or non-experienced people, uh, they, they even occur on websites where we would not expect that. We did an analysis of the FIFA.com website uh, during the World Cup in 2014, and we found out that one of the largest items on that page, or actually the largest item, not one of the, but the largest item, was the FAF icon. It was an image file with 370 kilobytes. 
together with uh, two more files, uh, one uh, CSS files, uh, CSS file and one JavaScript file, uh, those three files had a total size of more than 800 kilobytes. Could easily have been reduced. Happened just by following, not, by not following best practices for website design. A colleague of mine has, has created a blog about uh, further details of, of that website. It's pretty interesting. So you find the link here. You find my slides uh, later on. I'll uh, publish them on, on SlideShare. So you can use that link if you're interested. And uh, this poor design of, of those websites, uh, of, of, of that website, uh, FIFA.com, even resulted in their mobile app to crash, so it was not, not only the, the desktop website, but also the backend and everything that was poorly designed, and the, the mobile, ash, uh, mobile uh, app crashed a couple of days before the official start of the World Cup and was not available anymore. Uh, and then the question is, when could that have been found out? And Finding out that the FAF icon is 370 kilobytes uh, could have been done before production. If, if the file is that large in the production environment, it's also large in a test environment, or, or also in a, in a development environment. So the stage where you can find out such problems is very early in your development life cycle. Maybe even in, in a requirements definition, we could have put a line there, please make sure that your FAF icon is small. Probably it was not done because we expect that of a developer that for the FAF icon, just a small icon that's used in the address line of the browser is not uh, an image with 370 kilobytes. And when we, when we consider the relative cost of bug fixing through all our uh, product life cycle, um, it's obvious that we should find out such issues as soon as possible. Well, through all the years, that was an issue because our teams, our development teams, testers, operations worked behind walls. They were individual teams, they didn't talk to each other. There was the development team, testing team probably was located in a completely different office, then there was operations. But for, uh, fortunately these times have changed and these barriers have been removed. And we've gone through not only a mobile revolution in the last couple of years, but also through a DevOps revolution. We are building DevOps teams where these teams or these sub-teams, developers, testers, operators work together. But still, a developer is a developer, a tester is a tester, and when these people talk to each other, they might talk about the same thing but see it from a different angle and see different meanings of a certain problem. And not only in software development, uh, most problems in, in the world can be traced back to a lack of communication. So communication is important. And especially in our world, when we do software development, IT operations, uh, we have a common language and that's our metrics. We can measure everything in our application and use the result of that to communicate with our other teams in, in the life cycle. So we talked about where to start monitoring, where to start or when to start monitoring. And as it's about metrics now, I want to not only talk about monitoring, but measuring. So it's also the question what we could measure. And we have different levels of measuring here. On the one hand, we could measure just the, the high level things like request rates, response rates, but that maybe only shows us the tip of the iceberg. But the more 
in detail we go into our application, the more we measure, the more options we have to use these metrics to correlate with each other and get a detailed insight in what's happening in our application. To be a little more specific on, on, on metrics, I'd like to make, I'd like to split these metrics into three uh, sections. On the one hand, we have host metrics, process metrics, transactional metrics. In detail, host metrics, we all know that. Either it's on a physical host or a virtual host, but always important, we have CPU times, we have memory, we have disk usage, uh, we have network usage, network consumption, typical host data. But also other metrics on the host like running processes, number of processes. While the process details are seen separately, but actually the number of processes is, is a typical metric for the host. And not just, let's not just use uh, values at a certain time, but really uh, let's see these metrics over a certain time. And that gives us the possibility to create baselines here to see how does my environment behave normally and we can react easily then when these baselines that we create here are violated and we can create alerts based on that automatically just by uh, alerting on baseline viol violations. We don't need to use uh, absolute values here to create an alert when CPU times goes above whatever percentage, but really create an alert when the regular pattern is, is violated in the environment. On the other hand, we have processes running on a certain environment, running on a certain host, and these metrics that we had for the host itself are important here, again. CPU, memory, traffic on the network, disk usage for that certain process. But process metrics can go more in detail, like depending on, on the type of process that we have. A Java process, for instance, has other important metrics like garbage collection time, suspension times. Web servers, load balancers have important relevant metrics like uh, accept rates, uh, connection rates, request rates. Um, in that case, what we are doing here, we have, we have a monitor, we, have, uh, uh, we, are, we are showing the metrics that we capture from Nginx Plus and show them in our dashboards. We can go more in detail here to uh, show upstream rates, so how load is distributed between my different servers. To see that uh, graphically, it's easy to find out when something something's violated here. So far to process metrics. We have our transactional metrics, and with transaction metrics, I'd like to split that again in two sections. On the one hand, we have transactions from a user perspective. On the other hand, we have transactions from a server-side perspective. So what does that mean in detail? When we open a web page, when we go to the browser, add our address to the URL line, click en uh, press enter, or when we click on a link on a certain button, we trigger a user action that has a certain response time. This is the transaction from the user's perspective. The uh, Google developer tools, or also Firebug, for instance, uh, show these results uh, easily in, in, in the bottom line. You can see uh, total load times for that web page. While that request, that user action, triggers certain server-side transactions in the, in, in the back end. So it requests static files, JavaScript, CSS files, images, 
but also uh, triggers uh, requests that are sent further to application servers that end up in a Java engine or in a PHP engine. When we consider these transactions from the user side, uh, we can use characteristics of that transaction to categorize it further. So we can define what channel, uh, on, on what channel this transaction is coming into our server. So typically, we make a difference here between desktop environments, native mobile environments, or mobile browser environments. Because we heard before, the user expect, expectation to the application might be different here. So users might use different functionality in different, on different channels. On the other hand, these split into different channels gives us the option uh, to find out about possible errors in, in the client just on a certain channel. And when we find out, like shown in this example, that there are client errors mainly occurring on Android, then we can use that information to correlate it with other metrics to find out what, what's, what's the, the, the user experience on that channel on Android in general? Is the user satisfied here what, with what he gets delivered, how the application behaves? What is the conversion rate? Uh, what is the bounce rate? So is, are my users using that channel at all? Or are they bouncing off on a mobile device immediately? And based on this information, so when we correlate conversion rates, bounce rates with response times, error rates, we can create uh, missing a word now. Okay, so one step beside. We can decide actually if we need to investigate further into certain problems, or if we can ignore those errors for the beginning and concentrate on other things because they are more important because more users are coming from that channel. Uh, another example with that distinction, uh, we have, for instance, uh, a website where desktop traffic has uh, typically response times around two seconds. And when we split that traffic, when we drill that further down, and we see that traffic that's coming in via Chrome has typically response times of around 10 seconds, while other browsers behave normally, that's typically indica an indication that something in the browser, in the DOM, is probably running wrong or in the JavaScript engine or whatever. But using that information and with uh, rates, with uh, uh, regressed rates on that certain channel, we can again decide, do we need to investigate further immediately or can that wait longer? On the other hand, when, when we see that no one's using Chrome at all, Maybe we can ignore it completely. On the other hand, the question might be, why is no one using Chrome? Maybe the Chrome users are not using our website because it's slow. An option would be, check the bounce rate. Are users coming in and bouncing off? So are users trying to use the website? But are, or are they not even trying? We, we cannot find a general rule on that, how to, to handle that. But it's important to use metrics from different sides, from different angles, to decide what to do, correlate these metrics properly. With our transactions, we can go further. So we uh, considered the transactions from, from the user's perspective. Uh, now, on the, on the server side, we have other relevant uh, metrics here, like uh, response times for a certain web request on the server or transfer rates, bytes, uh, header size, body size, uh, timing details. For a transaction that creates a, a web request on the application server, like a Java re a request for Java or PHP, we, have, we can drill down further and find out other metrics like uh, where in my application is most uh, of, my, of my time spent. 
So which API consumes most time in my, in my transaction? If we find that out, we can even drill down further and say, okay, my API, which does a credit card check, for instance, has that structure and what actual class in Java, what method uh, is my performance hot, hotspot here, where is most of the time spent. But not just in the application, uh, we said we really go from end to end, so the application is not the end of our process. Uh, most times it's the database, so also consider what's happening in the database. Response times from the database, database health. Another important metric with the database is actually not taken from the database directly, but from the application. And this is the number of transactions that, are, that is sent to the database. And I like this metric a lot because we can use that already in test automation to find out possible performance problem in the production environment. I give you an example. We are doing a build in our application. Everything is fine. The next build, build 18, uh, returns a, a failed test in our test purchase test. So it goes back to development, they are fixing the problem, and build 19 is okay again. So everything's fine, our requirements are fulfilled, build 19 goes into production. What could happen here is that all of a sudden in production we have a performance problem. So why that? Let's look behind the scenes. Let's not only do unit tests here, but also do capture performance metrics from the tests. And by performance metrics, I also mean number of database calls, for instance. So build 17, everything's fine. Build 18, uh, we have a number of exceptions here, which result in the failed test. So it goes back into development. They try to fix it, create a workaround for that. Uh, we don't have exceptions anymore, but all of a sudden, the number of SQL statements has increased dramatically, and also the number of CPU time. When we are measuring just the response time of the test here, or our, our method that we are testing, we might not see a difference, because the amount of data in the test environment is not significant compared to the amount of data in the production environment. But when we already see that the number of SQL statements has increased dramatically, we can be sure that we might have a problem in the production environment where we have huge amount of data. So it goes back to development again. They fix that. We are back to our original values because they found the problem where they added that number of SQL statements and now build 20 can go into production with new features and we can be sure that we don't run into performance problems here. On the other hand, deploying code changes into a production system, we can use uh, other metrics to, to check our deployment if everything went wrong. In that example, we have a certain timestamp when we did the deployment. So that chart shows uh, web requests. So the, these red, brown ones are slow web requests. The orange one, faster ones, up to the green ones, which are the fast web requests. So we did a deployment here to increase performance. And we saw that actually everything worked well. Well, there was an outage, which requires further investigation, but that's a different topic. The other chart shows the traffic on our load balancers. So traffic is distributed equally here, seems to be fine. On the other hand, our backend servers, our application servers, show that there is one server where we still have slow requests, while the requests on the other servers seem to be fine. Well, does that automatically mean we have a deployment problem? It could be that the code, the changes, were not deployed properly to that server. But on the other hand, we could have 
a proper deployment, but we could have a problem on the host in general. So let's get back to the host, check the metrics from the host, correlate these metrics with these metrics that we got from the deployment verification, and we should have the answer to our question. So well, when you have your application, be sure to do proper monitoring throughout the entire stack, starting at the user down to the database, through all stages of your product lifecycle. Really try to figure out already in development what could be figured out there. Use proper testing, performance testing, already in, in the test environment and for sure in the production environment. Use the proper tools for that. So to make sure that at the end we have an application and all our users are happy with that, the user experience is a good one and people like to come back to your application and use it regularly. Thank you, that's it from my side. Um, one thing, uh, we, there is a, an interesting conference uh, next month, uh, the PERFORM conference in uh, Florida, Orlando, October 14 to 16. Uh, you can find further information on that on our website, www.dynatrace.com. Uh, you also have links there uh, to our free trial product and free developer uh, product. And find me on Twitter. Uh, there's a link to our blog, interesting information, also nice blogs uh, about Nginx topics there. Cool, a lot of cool stuff. Okay, questions? Yeah. Uh, actually, what, what we instrument is uh, a certain process. So, for instance, uh, an Nginx process, we instrument an agent there. We are agent-based technology. Uh, in the Java tier, in the Java engine, PHP, we, you instrument the agent. And these agents uh, talk with a central server then and send the collected data there. All the correlation is done in the server and the transactions flow, the transaction flow that you saw is created there automatically. You don't need to configure that, but this is the information that's collected by the agents. So for the, the Java agent, is that a, a class? How do you, what, what is it that you have to put into your application code to, make, to give it that, that access to the agent? Uh, for, the, for the Java, it's actually a parameter that you add to the, uh, uh, to the Java, when you start up the Java engine and that loads uh, a module, uh, our agent, uh, into the Java engine. It's not a class that you have to add to your application. We don't touch the application itself at all. We don't touch the source code. We hook onto the, the running application. But uh, feel free to stop by at our booth. You can show it in detail there. Okay. More questions? Yeah. Uh, we, uh, currently, we support uh, Java, PHP, dot, uh, .NET, uh, Node.js. Um, other technologies, Ruby, Python, are on the roadmap. And depending on requirements from the community, it's sooner or later. But we have a, a forum where we have uh, a special section for uh, RFEs, requests for enhancements, and so Product management is always checking that and, and uh, creating decisions based on, on the requirements there. Okay. More questions? Okay, then. Thank you.